Levi Bartle Hospital and uh, uh, ably supported by all our uh, fellow speakers and teachers from all the institutes now, not just from our city, but also from the whole country. And uh, it's, it's my proud privilege to uh, introduce to you the, speak, the speaker as well as the chairperson for today. Uh, the chairperson, Dr. Hinal Shah, uh, well, what do I say for her? She is a very dear friend, but uh, she is modesty personified. And when I asked her to share with me her introduction, she just sent me a line saying, I'm an additional professor at Nair Hospital, and that's what I want you to say. But I think that uh, the, the brevity of her uh, introduction is also the strength of her introduction. She is a very, very astute teacher. I've known her for many years. Uh, and uh, she is uh, not just a good clinician, but also a very dedicated teacher. She has worked at the Department of Psychiatry at Nair Hospital. And she was briefly at KEM as well, if I remember correctly, right? That's right, that's right. But then she's back to the alma mater and... Uh, we are very grateful for her to have taken the time out and uh, uh, joined us today to moderate and chair this session. Uh, and uh, I will request her to take over the proceedings of the evening and introduce Dr. John and uh, take the program forward. Uh, thank you all once again for being with us and uh, I'll see you at the end of the talk. Uh, over to you, Nal, please. Thank you, the Rashman. It's a pleasure always to be with you. And I again take this opportunity to congratulate you. I think it's a wonderful effort and a dedicated effort that over these so many years, it started as a small with people coming only from Mumbai, but now you, sp you spread it to the whole length and breadth of the country, not only in terms of who speaks, but also who attends. So this is a continuous and a dedicated effort at um, competency growing of our of our residents and i must say that it's not only residents for many of the of the sessions many of the seniors also attend because it's always knowledge that we all seek for so congratulations once again for this wonderful series that you're running and today is a very interesting series on uh, you know non suicidal self injurious behavior in adolescence um, with this pandemic background and emotional turmoil increasing during this period, this kind of behavior may also increase. Anyway, we know that it occurs often, reflects many things under, under, uh, that uh, belie it, and treatment is not always simple. So to enlighten us further on this topic, we have with us uh, Dr. Jo uh, John, uh, Dr. John, who is a professor and head of department at NIMHANS. He is a, a postgraduate from Nimhans and then he's done his a senior residency at Valor and Jipma. And um, he's been in Nimhans for the last 11 years. His areas of current interest include neurodevelopment disorders, especially autism, pediatric psychopharmacology, adolescent mental health, child abuse, and neurobiology of child psychiatric disorders. He has authored more than 80 um, articles and multiple chapters in books. And uh, he is one of the prestigious NIH USA funded Indo-US Fogarty Fellowship in 2015. And under this fellowship, he has trained at the McKnight Brain Institute in Florida, USA, and has been recently appointed as an affiliate faculty at the School of Biological and Population Health Sciences in Oregon State University, USA. I also I also had the pleasure of, uh, uh, if I may ask others to please mute. I also had the pleasure of working, interacting with him in uh, during uh, many CMEs and also on a paper that we co-published. A wonderful, humble person. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. John. And may I hand it over to you to continue the, ah, uh, the discussion. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, at the outset, I thank uh, Professor Hanel, uh, ma'am, for her uh, kind words of introduction. And uh, uh, I have been uh, associated, I would say, recently with ma'am uh, on a very important publication, the Clinical Practice Guidelines for uh, Specific Learning Disorders in Children and Adolescents, uh, which was published uh, as a uh, supplement uh, of all the clinical practice guidelines uh, in uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry by the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. And also, 
uh, in several uh, cmes and uh, programs and uh, uh, madam is uh, very good clinician as well as academician uh, and uh, also i would like to thank uh, the department psychiatry dy patel school of medicine navi mumbai and uh, when dr rashmin uh, had contacted me about uh, this lecture series uh, i was very happy uh, primarily because uh, these kind of opportunities uh, i see it as a learning experience and uh, uh, interacting uh, with especially uh, the young post graduate uh, trainees and uh, some uh, faculty uh, definitely in uh, any topic related to uh, mental health especially in uh, child and adolescent mental health uh, is definitely a great learning experience so today uh, also i would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to choose the topic and uh, so uh, when i was thinking about the possible topics uh, uh, the choice of topic like i uh, felt that uh, the non suicidal self injury in adolescents uh, is uh, something which uh, we are coming across uh, very often these days in the adolescent uh, age group and uh, as mental health professionals uh, we need to uh, know certain basic aspects of this uh, uh, construct of non suicidal self injury and uh, how uh, we need to assess uh, the adolescents who present with non suicidal self injury how to manage uh, etc so uh, i will just share uh, the powerpoint slides so uh, first and foremost uh, how do we define the non suicidal self injury uh, it is a direct deliberate destruction of one's own body without any intent to die uh, the key words here are lack of intent that is without any intent to die also it is not socially approved unlike some of the socially approved uh, uh, things which people do say for example uh, tattooing or uh, piercing the body uh, for cultural reasons etc religious or cultural reasons uh, that doesn't come under the nssi so uh, what is the prevalence of this uh, particular phenomena so lifetime estimates according to uh, research studies it ranges from anywhere between 7% to about 25% uh, prevalence is high in clinical populations uh, even to the extent of almost uh, 65% has been described in some uh, certain studies however uh, recent literature has shown that uh, among different age groups uh, in adolescents the prevalence may be around 15 to 20% and uh, in young adults slightly lesser uh, among adults uh, it's just around 5 to 6% most of these instances of non suicidal self injury almost 80% uh, it happens uh, not just on one occasion it happens multiple times also uh, it's a global phenomena there is no difference uh, among the countries and uh, no, among as i mentioned across different age groups it can happen uh, it happens both in boys and girls and uh, even in young adults adults etc and uh, it's a global phenomenon and also it's of uh, public health importance uh, when we look at the prevalence of this uh, particular phenomena and the recurrent uh, nature of this phenomena and uh, it's uh, definitely of a public health importance among the uh, mental health issues in the adolescents so what is the uh, relationship or the link between the nssi and the suicidal behaviors so there is often uh, misunderstood the relationship and uh, some one uh, school of thought is that nssi is in itself a form of suicidal behavior also uh, there is other view point that states that uh, there could be uh, you know a little uh, overlap between these things but uh, nssi is a different entity altogether so nssi is comparatively more uh, common and also more frequent than suicidal behaviors and nssi is uh, usually uh, through several methods 
and compared to suicidal behaviors and uh, it results in uh, less severe damage uh, when we look at it in the medical terms uh, the injury that is caused to the person uh, also nssi is uh, a predictor of uh, suicidal attempts so let us briefly uh, look into the clinical features with which uh, the adolescents can present uh, definitely there are signs of self injury uh, these include cut marks bruises or burn marks uh, repeated self injury and uh, can result in uh, local infection of the wounds caused by the self injury and uh, there could be pain related to self injury the adolescent uh, can hide the self injury uh, either by uh, wearing uh, long sleeved uh, clothes or by using bandages or hiding certain sharp objects which they have used to cause the self injury associated with the self injury there are uh, emotional and behavioral changes the adolescent could be withdrawn or restless uh, there could be changes in the sleep and eating habits lack of interest or lack of concentration feelings of sadness anxiety guilt hopelessness worthlessness all these uh, uh, changes can be seen in the adolescents in few adolescents uh, there is an overlap between nssi and uh, suicidal behavior so the adolescents report suicidal ideas as well as the attempts there are several common misconceptions about uh, the non suicidal self injury i have listed some of the common uh, misconceptions on this slide one of the misconception is that it is the same as suicidal attempt and also uh, when it uh, when we look at the gender uh, uh, prevalence uh, only girls engage in nssi and persons who are engaging in this non suicidal self injury they are attention seeking by themselves and they are quite manipulate and it's almost always associated with a uh, history of child abuse or personality disorder and asking about self injury itself may induce nssi phenomena in adolescents and nssi is a phenomena seen only in the western countries and no one can help the person even if uh, the person himself or herself were to disclose or uh, during uh, a routine assessment if you are able to make out that the person is uh, engaging in the nssi uh, we will not be able to help that person and the last but not the least all those who engage in nssi are mentally ill so these are the common misconceptions and when it comes to professional help seeking we see that uh, only about half of them uh, they seek professional help there are several barriers uh, to help seeking so one is lack of awareness about the available professional resources and uh, feelings of helplessness hopelessness Uh, the caregivers themselves the parents or the other caregivers being unaware of the nssi and the parents or the other adult caregivers looking at nssi as uh, just a transient phase and uh, or uh, this is something as a you know a turmoil during the teenage period or uh, this just uh, the adolescent uh, uh, no uh, engaging in some dramatic behavior so they may label it like that and they may not uh, seek help and uh, there could be lot of apprehension and uh, stigma about uh, you know this label of mental illness uh, especially when they have to seek uh, help from the mental health professionals the adolescents themselves they may feel that uh, they will be blamed so they are not very keen to seek help so in the clinical settings how does it present uh, the adolescents may come to the emergency services uh, in the immediate aftermath of the self injury and uh, they can consult a psychiatrist uh, who is available in the emergency services or it can happen in the outpatient setting uh, for medical issues uh, say for example uh, you know uh, any medical condition wherein during the uh, especially the physical examination the physician detects that the adolescent has injured himself or herself multiple times uh, if say for example on physical examination they find multiple superficial cut marks on the forearms 
or it could be related to medical issues related to nssi say for example local wound infection or uh, primarily for uh, some of the emotional and behavioral kind of uh, symptoms that are present uh, in the adolescents and it can be also uh, we can find uh, the uh, presence of nssi in uh, the adolescent inpatients uh, who have been uh, Uh, admitted for management of severe emotional and behavioral symptoms in all these contexts uh, we can come across adolescents uh, in the clinical setting uh, with a presentation of nssi so let us briefly look at some of the risk factors or clinical correlates of this nssi uh, these can be uh, classified into biological psychological and uh, family or social kind of factors so among the biological factors uh, the age where it is uh, highly prevalent is uh, between 13 to 15 years or uh, you know that is what we can say the uh, the middle adolescence uh, period uh, the presence of nssi prior to the age of 11 or 12 uh, is uncommon when compared to uh, no nssi in the middle adult, uh, adolescent age as well as the older adolescents uh the latter adolescence part and uh, it is slightly more common in the females uh, though it can occur in both females as well as males uh, the prevalence wise it's slightly more common in females and also it is seen that among the biological factors uh, these adolescents seem to have uh, increased the pain tolerance uh, ability and also uh, temperamentally uh, they seem to have at least uh, though not all of them uh many of them seem to have uh, temperamental issues especially uh, either uh, anxious traits in the temperament or uh, a difficult temperament etc uh, at the brain level uh, the stress responses are said to be ineffective and among the psychological factors uh, the emotional uh, reactivity is, is said to be high and uh, impulse control is said to be poor in these uh, uh, people and it's considered as significant risk factor negative view of self or others and future and hopelessness and uh, dysfunctional interpersonal relationships um uh, bullying experiences and having certain mental health needs uh, so these are found as risk factors in the psychological domain and uh, amongst the family or social factors factors like parental neglect or abuse uh, especially the emotional abuse parental uh, critique or apathy domestic violence and also we see that uh, the inf- the last uh, two points are important especially with uh, the influence of media nowadays what we are seeing is the social media uh, many of the adolescents uh, they are uh, active users of the social media whether it's facebook whatsapp instagram snapchat whatever it is Uh, on that uh, many of them they uh, regularly uh, chat with other adolescents and uh, some of them we see that uh, they create uh, certain content uh, about this uh, self harm or self injury and also uh, sometimes about the nssi and uh, they may actually post their pictures etc on the social media and uh, this can happen as a social contagion like uh, if uh, especially in uh, schools or even uh, when adolescents are admitted in the inpatient setting if more than uh, one adolescent uh, has that nssi behavior so the possibility of a, this social contagion effect is there so let us briefly look at uh, one of the uh, models that has been uh, recently uh, described in the literature so in that uh, what we can see is that uh, there are uh, distal risk factors as well as the proximal risk factors and uh, the risk factors results in vulnerability both at the interpersonal level as well as the intra or within the person level uh, and these uh, you no know, risk factors and the vulnerability uh, they lead to the nssi eventually so as you can see on this uh, particular slide so the distal risk factors uh, include uh, childhood trauma family dysfunction etc proximal risk factors uh, any ongoing stress or uh, uh, any recent uh, 
life events or situations uh, which the person is facing uh, and the interpersonal uh, vulnerability factors include uh, as you uh, know deficits or uh, uh, especially skill deficits uh, in the communication as well as the social problem solving domains uh, in the intrapersonal factors uh, the emotional and cognitive uh, factors are very important and especially uh, poor emotional uh, regulation and uh, having negative cognitions and uh, inability to tolerate the distress and uh, or a poor uh, a distress tolerance uh, is uh, said to be a significant vulnerability factor so uh, when we look at what purpose does this uh, non suicidal self injury serve uh, so we can say that uh, broadly at the intrapersonal as well as the interpersonal levels uh, the purposes could include that uh, in the interpersonal level and it uh, helps reducing the negative thoughts or negative feelings uh, for the person who is engaging in this nssi and also it increases the experience of pleasant or positive feelings or thoughts in the intra interpersonal uh, uh, area the relief from the unpleasant social participation and also reinforcing social interaction so these are the uh, main purposes uh, that nssi seems to serve and uh, in a clinical situation how to go about uh, eliciting uh, the nssi and uh, suppose we come across an adolescent uh, who presents with this clinical features how to go about so it is important to ask about self injury in a way that uh, makes the person feel comfortable uh, instead of making the individual feel more ashamed or guilty and definitely this has to be done in private and away from the other people and uh, being a sensitive topic uh, uh, the self like when we are inquiring about the self injury we need to allocate uh, adequate time um, when uh, you know the person adolescent is upset it may not be the right time to talk about this and uh, we have to find uh, a you uh, know a time when uh, the adolescent is likely to talk about it and you know inquire about this uh, nssi uh it's very important to directly communicate to the adolescent and uh, you know uh, to be very clear and uh, say for example telling the person that uh, we have noticed that he or she is having a hard time and uh, that uh, as a professional as a mental health uh, professional you care for them and you want to help and to assess the severity of nssi certain questions uh, you know can be asked uh, say for example what are the specific methods of self injury that have been used how often the person has been uh, engaging in this behavior and uh, at any point of time did uh, he or she need medical attention for self injury and uh, have they at any point of time thought about uh, Uh, medical care uh, but they didn't get the same and whether uh, they are thinking about other kinds of self injury methods oh, so second. what are those methods can i ask everybody to please mute so that uh, the speaker doesn't get interrupted and we can have a good interaction thank you thank you madam so uh, next uh, we move on to questions to actually assess the motivation uh, in the adolescent to address this uh, self injury uh, or nssi uh, you know to uh, basically motivation to change uh, we need to ask questions uh, looking at what usually happens right before the person uh, injures themselves and how they feel before they uh, engage in this nssi and how do they feel right after that behavior and what does the self injury do for uh, him or her and what does the self in how uh, it is helpful to them and uh, what isn't as helpful um, and uh, do they want to stop uh, this behavior if so why or uh, no if they don't want to stop why not so there are several assessment tools uh, which can be used uh, in the clinical as well as the research settings Uh, when we are evaluating adolescents presenting with nssi i have listed a few tools here there is a long list uh, no i have not put all the uh, 
tools or scales here. These are some of the common tools. Uh, inventory of uh, statements about self-injury, ISAS is a very common instrument uh, that is used. Ottawa self-injury inventory, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors interview, non-suicidal self-injury disorder scale, etc. Uh, there are several other tools also uh, which uh, can be used uh, to assist. The, the tools themselves uh, uh, will not uh, be sufficient. So we have to do a thorough clinical evaluation and tools uh, are going to assist us uh, as part of the evaluation. So coming to the role of parents, uh, so what we need to tell the parents. Uh, so we need to tell the parents that if they suspect uh, self-injury, better to ask the adolescent. Uh, that initial feeling of awkwardness or nervousness or apprehensions or any misconceptions, these things are quite normal. So we have to validate that. Um, also, uh, they should not induce any guilt in the young person. Uh, they should allot time for any discussion. Uh, so before asking questions, we need to tell the person that uh, we have noticed that he or she is having a hard time. Uh, in the school context, uh, this is another uh, important uh, you know, context apart from the clinical and the home context wherein you know, the uh, NSSI uh, has to be identified and addressed. The teachers and school counselors, uh, they may be the first ones to uh, no, to whom the child uh, may disclose or it may get revealed by the peer group or the parents. Uh, they have to respond. The teachers and school counselors have to respond in a calm and non-judgmental manner. Uh, it's an attempt. Self-injury they have to see as an attempt to cope with the problem or not the problem in itself. Self-injury is often uh, you know, the person who is engaging in this NSSI uh, is uh, emotionally distressed and uh, this should be seen as a cry for help and uh, the key uh, thing to do is to focus on the underlying issues rather than the behavior itself so it is very important to have the caring environment in schools uh, with neutrality and ensuring availability of staff accepting the child's emotions and the staff themselves uh, they serve as models for emotional regulation problem solving skills and conflict resolution and uh, they need to be dependable, the teachers, uh, school counselors, as well as other uh, school staff. And uh, they have to be consistent in their responses. And uh, last but not the least, the confidentiality has to be maintained. So uh, as mental health professionals, when we have to train the school staff, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, the training component should include identifying the self-injury, ensuring immediate care for injuries, uh, differentiating between the NSSI as well as the suicidal behavior and uh, responding with uh, what is called as a respectful curiosity. Uh, so this respectful curiosity can be uh, you know, uh, shown by just expressing to the adolescent saying that uh, it appears that you have hurt yourself. Uh, do you want to talk about it? And showing the, uh, you know, your availability saying that I am willing to listen to uh, whatever you would like to say uh, at this point of time. And also showing that genuine concern, uh, I'm concerned about you and want uh, to be sure that you have the support you need. Uh, also, if at that point of time, the adolescent is uh, not willing to talk to the school teacher or counselor, uh, they have to uh, convey to the adolescent that uh, they, they can talk to someone else uh, whom they trust. Uh, so it may not be immediately with the teacher, but uh, definitely it's important for them to talk to someone. It could be a family member or it could be a, uh, a mental health professional or a friend or whoever it is. Uh, also conveying availability. So whenever they want to talk about these things uh, that you are going to be available uh, and just exploring the situations and also uh, you know, when did they begin uh, engaging in this kind of behavior and what, what role does self-injury play in their life right now? So all these things uh, they have to explore. Uh, then uh, broadly at the school, uh, they have to respond, uh, of course, using this respectful curiosity, as I mentioned, 
and uh, should not minimize these behaviors but at same time should not overreact uh, showing shock or uh, no very exaggerated emotional displays important to assess uh, the immediate danger uh, the severity of the behavior and uh, you know whether there is any suicidal risk uh, risk of contagion and also whether it's prevalent uh, in the student population in that school then it's important to engage directly with the uh, adolescent who is uh, you know uh, injuring himself or herself and the the peers of that uh, you know uh, who is uh, who are connected to that adolescent who are providing support and of course the family then uh, after engage the educate is very important uh, the staff should be educated regarding the signs and symptoms of appropriate response strategies and uh, finally uh, the community based uh, therapist to address the symptoms of distress uh, they have to refer and there should be a crisis team uh, in the, at the school level with a school counselor and few uh, dedicated teachers and uh, this crisis team needs in depth training how to respond to this uh, self injurious behaviors and the periodic training can be provided by mental health professionals crisis team is responsible for immediately attending to the necessary and the crisis team in turn has to liaise effectively with the parents as well as mental health professionals uh, they are responsible for addressing the social contagion and also the risk assessment and arranging the referrals so this is a uh, algorithm uh, which uh, gives a example of a school protocol uh, say for example if the student shows uh, signs and symptoms and uh, the staff suspects student self injury or the there is self disclosure or peer disclosure one of the ways actually schools becomes aware of the student self injury then immediately that uh, the wounds are uh, treated and uh, if uh, wounds are severe or life threatening uh, the person is uh, referred to a hospital uh, otherwise uh, you know the point person meets with the student and assesses the risk whether the low risk or high risk or uh, say low risk or moderate to high risk so it is very important to engage the adolescents in conversations and uh, motivate them for behavioral change and make them avail the formal support uh, that can be offered however there are several challenges and uh, uh, this is one age group adolescents uh, which all of you uh, know uh, you know uh, from your uh, you know clinical experience that uh, they don't open up very easily and uh, also another important challenge is the stigma and the sense of hopelessness and adolescents uh, having the sense of autonomy many of them uh, they feel that it is their body and uh, they should have control over the body and uh, they can at any time injure themselves and uh, they don't like uh, an adult uh, looking at the self injury uh, as a problem or you know trying to change uh, their behaviors and uh, the last but not the least you uh, know uh, trivializing this behavior or minimizing this behavior so coming to the uh, research about the interventions uh, so in terms of interventions we all know that uh, different levels of efficacy uh, are there like where in uh, from uh, one extreme where well established kind of interventions are there to probably efficacious possibly efficacious experimental and treatments of questionable efficacy and among them uh, both probably and possibly efficacious interventions that is level 2 and 3 are cognitive behavior therapy interpersonal psychotherapy family therapy uh, psychodynamic therapy dialectical behavior therapy mentalization based so there are different therapeutic approaches that are available so i am not going into details of individual therapies uh, due to time constraints uh, but the process and mechanisms of intervention for nssi should involve the collaborative therapeutic relationships between the therapist as well as the adolescent and the motivation for change uh, and directly addressing the nssi behaviors so this is uh, the most effective way of reducing the nssi according to some of the research uh, that is available and a collaborative approach uh, among uh, like has to be there among all the relevant stakeholders and in that the adolescent himself or herself is the most important person followed by the parents 
the physician in the emergency setting, the psychiatrist, the clinical psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker, etc. And of course, you know, the in the school context, the teachers, the school counselors, all these people uh, can be included in this collaborative approach. Uh, so immediate uh, attention to the wounds caused by NSSI in the emergency setting is important. And immediate psychological support, that is a first level support, has to be provided in the emergency setting. And in the outpatient setting, there will be more time for a formal clinical evaluation, uh, looking at the pattern of self-injury, looking at the development of psychological and behavioral aspects, uh, looking at various contextual factors, the mental status of the adolescent, assessing their level of functioning, assessing the suicidal risk, and uh, looking for any diagnosable psychotic disorders, and finally, the physical examination. So, and of course, different therapies uh, I have alluded to already. Along with that, uh, license with the school family intervention. Pharmacotherapy is needed only when there are specific psychiatric symptoms uh, that needs to be addressed, uh, whether related to depression, anxiety, etc. And uh, regular follow-up sessions are important. So inpatient care is needed for only those adolescents where it is frequent, the behavior is frequent, and there is significant impairment of functioning. There is severe level of co-occurring psychiatric disorders and co-occurrence of suicidal behaviors. Uh, sometimes adolescent may state that, yes, uh, he or she has an intent uh, to die, and uh, there are some suicidal attempts. At other times, they say that uh, there is no suicidal intent and no, uh, they uh, injure themselves superficially. So this uh, combination, actually, it is better to go for the inpatient care, especially when more frequent behaviors are there, uh, because intensive uh, individual as well as the family intervention uh, will be required. And also for those adolescents who lack adequate support in the home context, we may have to admit them uh, initially and uh, start the treatment. Uh, before proceeding on for a regular follow-up sessions in the OP setting. So in the inpatient care, there should be constant supervision by the nursing staff, ensuring safe environment, daily sessions with the team of mental health professionals, enabling a structured daily routine for the adolescent and also improving the level of their functioning, thorough assessment of mental status and risk of recurrent self-injury or suicide, and addressing all the stressors, different areas like academic area, family, uh, factors as well as the peer related factors, intensive treatment for co occurring psychiatric disorders, and family therapy. Uh, lastly, uh, now about NSSI and psychiatric disorders, NSSI itself is not a psychiatric disorder. That's something we need to realize. Though, uh, if you look at the DSM 5, uh, it has uh, kept NSSI under the group of conditions which will require. Uh, what we call uh, further uh, you know, uh, studies or conditions that require further uh, you know, research. And also there is high rates of co-occurring depression and anxiety in adolescents with NSSI. So NSSI doesn't mean that the adolescent uh, has personality disorder, especially the borderline personality disorder. Effective evaluation of co-occurring psychiatric disorders and their management is vital for optimal outcome. And uh, so with that, I end my presentation and uh, I thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions or uh, anything if the participants uh, wish to add from their experience. Uh, I hand it over to the chairperson, Henel, ma'am. Thank you, um, Dr. John, for a very comprehensive uh, talk. You started from defining self-injurious behavior to um, the risk factors for self-injurious behavior to uh, how to identify clinically what should be done in schools, the management, comorbidity, and how to go about it. So within a short span of time, you've covered quite a few factors that we should be thinking about it. So let me start with the questions that is there. Dr. Varsha Angadi is asking, what are the non-pharmacological management of NS uh, of non-suicidal uh, self-injurious behavior? If you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, in terms of the non-pharmacological management uh, approaches, uh, I had briefly covered. I didn't go into too many details. So uh, first and foremost, uh, 
Uh, a supportive therapy approach is very important. So uh, supporting the adolescents uh, is uh, very important. Uh, uh, providing that neutral, uh, non-judgmental kind of stance and understanding uh, the uh, adolescents' uh, current stressors or problems, uh, their vulnerability, or uh, understanding all the risk factors and uh, the contextual factors that have created that risk and providing the immediate psychological support that is of utmost importance. Then, of course, uh, there are uh, the uh, psychotic approaches uh, like CBT, the cognitive behavior therapy approaches, where especially those adolescents who have uh, issues with uh, significant issues with uh, the negative cognitions, the cognitive behavioral approach is very useful. And also the dialectical behavior therapy for uh, some of the approaches from dialectical behavior therapy for uh, improving the emotional regulation and uh, also teaching the adolescents to handle the distress. And off late, uh, we see that apart from the, uh, the CBT and uh, the dialectical behavior therapy approaches, the mindfulness uh, uh, based therapies are also used to uh, improve the, uh, like basically to improve the distress tolerance in uh, the adolescents and also helping them to uh, relax, uh, you know, the, provide that mind-body relaxation for them, and also for them to focus on some of the present stressors and address that in therapy. So uh, all these approaches are available uh, in terms of the non-pharmacological management. Madam, you are uh, muted, madam. Like. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My apologies. So as Dr. John has said that there are a lot of therapies that are available, whether it is cognitive oh. therapy, whether it is dialectable therapy, whether it is dynamic therapy or impulse control, you know, Mudo's work on impulse control. Uh, and they are also available individual and group based. And there are also um, 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 uh, model, uh, modulated forms in the, in the, in the sense they're, they're with the books and how you can go step by step. Uh, the problem comes in how many of us as clinicians can do that. So one thing that we all can do is be empathetic. All of us can be supportive. All, all of us can offer space for them to think about. All of us can use a certain principles of CBT to encourage a uh, little bit of emotional regulation, decreasing negative cognitions. So this is simple to do even in a, in a clinician's cabin. So these are some things that you can definitely do. Um, um, uh, so the other question is if there is uh, if the if the adolescent has no motivation to change, you know what is the next step? And this question has been asked by Dr. Kumar. You know the okay. child has no motivation to stop doing this behavior. What does a clinician do next? Yeah, if the child has uh, no motivation to uh, stop the behavior or change the behavior, uh, like in the case of uh, any uh, uh, behavioral uh, conditions or behavioral disorders, uh, whether it is uh, you know, substance using kind of behavior or uh, you know, the uh, adolescents who present with significant conduct kind of uh, symptoms and behaviors related to conduct. So we need to uh, uh, enhance the motivation and uh, we need to assess uh, you know, the uh, barriers to motivation. Um, so it could be actually the significant uh, emotional and behavioral, uh, other emotional and behavioral kind of uh, symptoms that are present in the adolescent and we need to address that initially. And uh, uh, especially in those with uh, comorbid depression, anxiety, uh, the medication will be of help. Uh, so uh, we're uh, prescribing uh, anti like what we call the anxiolytic or antidepressant medication uh, will definitely be of help and uh, also uh, as i mentioned the uh, the contextual factor that play a very important role uh, so parents are adult caregivers in the home context and in the school uh, the teacher school counselor as well as the peer group uh, they can uh, play a very supportive role to the adolescent uh, 
and uh, that will help us to address the motivation. Yeah, thank you very much. As um, Dr. John has said that, you know, as we do in alcohol, we need to kind of keep motivating. And also to have a little bit of a systemic approach, you know, family systems approach also to younger adolescents because it may be a reflection of many other things that happen. And of course, as another, as um, um, uh, Dhwani has asked, what is the role of naltrexone in this kind of behavior? Okay, so uh, naltrexone, uh, we all know that it's a uh, opiate antagonist and. Uh, uh, it is uh, primarily used uh, in uh, adolescents as well as young adults when they come with uh, opioid dependence uh, as a primary diagnosis. However, uh, naltrexone has been uh, tried in uh, uh, some of the children and adolescents uh, with uh, repetitive self-injurious behaviors, especially those uh, who have this problem as uh, part of uh, developmental conditions, especially certain genetic conditions where there is recurrent self-injurious behavior. Uh, like say, for example, Leshnihan syndrome and uh, the child can present with autistic features. Uh, so having said that uh, in NSSI, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, specific uh, you know, uh, studies that have looked at the effectiveness of naltrexone. Uh, Primarily, the role of pharmacotherapy, as I uh, mentioned, uh, is to uh, manage the co-occurring uh, uh, emotional as well as the behavioral symptoms. Um, so, uh, naltrexone may not be uh, the first choice uh, when it comes to medication, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not aware of any recent trials where the efficacy of naltrexone has been uh, proven in NSSA. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, as Sarah said, there may not be recent things, but people have used naltrexone. The other two drugs that are commonly used are SSRIs for the depression and also for the impulsivity. And uh, aripiprazole is another drug which is occasionally used for this kind of behavior. And we'll come back more to that. But uh, um, Smita is asking, um, what is the role of a no suicide contract in adolescence? How does that work? And yeah. Uh, before answering the question, madam, just I would like to add uh, one point related to aripiprazole is uh, that the uh, whether it's aripiprazole or risperidone, uh, we uh, people uh, generally mental health professionals uh, have prescribed that for uh, those with uh, significant uh, mood dysregulation. Um, so usually it is given in combination with an SSRI, uh, starting with a low dose of risperidone, aripiprazole. Uh, can definitely help to reduce uh, the uh, dysregulation of mood and especially the intensity of dysregulation and uh, also the aggressive behavior that may be present in some children. Uh, then uh, with regards to the no suicide contract in adolescents, uh, it's, uh, no, uh, though uh, we see that uh, in some of the instances where uh, we uh, take this no suicide contract from the adolescents. So either we make them write or we ourselves write and uh, we sign and the adolescent signs. Uh, so usually the contract, uh, uh, no, the content will be that they are not going to injure themselves. And uh, no, if they have uh, uh, any uh, emotional issues or anything, any problems, they would discuss it in the therapy sessions rather than injuring themselves. Uh, so this has uh, not been you know, found to be very helpful. And uh, so that's something we need to keep in mind, saying that irrespective of whether you have a no social contract or, uh, no, or not, uh, providing adequate uh, you know, uh, non-pharmacological uh, therapeutic support is very important. And uh, just having a contract uh, will not suffice. Thank you. Uh, Madhumita is asking, can it be a can it be a learned NSSI without a personality factor? So independent of a borderline or any other personality, can you have uh, a non uh, self injurious behavior which is non suicidal? Yes, madam, we can have that. And uh, presence of NSSI doesn't always mean that uh, there is a coexisting personality disorder. And uh, also, uh, 
that holds true for even the other disorders uh, mm-hmm. though in the clinical settings especially if you look at uh, uh, say tertiary care uh, hospital uh, outpatient or inpatient or emergency settings where the adolescents come with uh, nssi uh, as a clinical presentation it's likely that uh, high percentage of them have uh, the comorbid disorders uh, usually depression uh, the depression also can be chronic uh, like a dysthymia and uh, anxiety several anxiety disorders and uh, many of them uh, like during that period though uh, we may not formally diagnose them as having uh, a personality disorder but uh, Uh, they could have some personality traits uh, that are evolving and uh, so we need to follow up uh, you know those adolescents and uh, to see uh, also i think there was a re- there is a related question by uh, professor tv anil kumar from trivandrum uh, sir has asked uh, long term prognosis and intervention in girls in care homes with borderline uh, personality disorder traits uh, sir many of these children actually like uh, in the child care institutions uh, no i uh, in my presentation i talked about uh, the vulnerability aspects both the interpersonal and intrapersonal vulnerability and uh, also the proximal as well as the digital risk factors so many of them has multiple such factors and uh, no right from the early childhood onwards and uh, no uh, that would have led them to uh, uh, a situation where uh, they are currently placed in the child care institution Uh, they are the children who are in need of care and protection or uh, they could be especially here uh, sir is asking about girls uh, typically they are in the children's homes girls home uh, either run by the government or ngos so in them if uh, there are some evolving personality traits especially borderline personality traits uh, they will require a formal uh, uh, evaluation clinical evaluation uh, by a mental health professional and uh, the uh, psychological uh, especially the psychotherapeutic interventions have to provided to address uh, the uh, issues that are emerging from the borderline personality traits typically they have the interpersonal uh, relationship difficulties or they can have uh, the self harm issues or they can have uh, uh, frequent mood dysregulation so all these things have to be evaluated and provided and uh, so when it comes to long term prognosis uh, if it uh, you know once they become adults if it continues as a borderline personality disorder clear uh, disorder many of them will have uh, other comorbid access one uh, disorders and uh, they require long term uh, psychosocial intervention that's what i would like to say thank you for that answer and the next question is um, what should you tell caregivers when you have a patient with nssai and you're sending them home So yes, what kind of advice or what kind of precaution safety measures should you talk to them about yes ma'am so though uh, nssi by definition we are saying that uh, the suicidal intent is uh, not present uh, but uh, we see that in some adolescents or few adolescents like there may be the overlap with uh, significant suicidal behaviors uh, so therefore uh, it's important for the caregivers Uh, to have close supervision on these adolescents and ensure a regular follow up with the mental health professionals in the home context uh, specifically uh, they have to whatever they learnt in the clinical setting in terms of uh, like because uh, especially in the cbt and dbt or whatever therapeutic approaches what we do with the uh, adolescent himself or herself we would have equipped them with lot of uh, skills to uh you know say for example emotional regulation skills problem solving skills uh, etc distress tolerance kind of skills uh, the family has to support them to uh, every time when there is a situation uh, that triggers an emotional outburst so they have to be supportive and allow the adolescent to practice those skills what they have learned and uh, they have to uh, basically uh, uh, be very non judgmental and if any crisis situation emerges immediately they should seek the mental health support very true it's best to be vigilant and keep your eyes open and also and you know engage with the parents so that everybody is vigilant and yet supportive yes. um dr sachin is asking in a newly married couple spouse notices all marks of such behavior 
uh, wants to know about future prognosis. How do you really talk to the husband and what do you tell him? <clears throat> very practical question. Yes, ma'am. Very practical and, uh, and in a way, a very tricky situation for the mental health professional, I would say. Uh, so, the, uh, basically here, uh, there may be a situation where the spouse uh, is not aware of uh, the, uh, the past uh, history of, the, of uh, his or her uh, partner at that time. And they, they would have just noticed the uh, certain uh, uh, physical signs of this NSSI. Uh, say, for example, in the forearm, there may be some superficial, that old kind of uh, you know, uh, cut marks uh, or uh, certain scars uh, that are created by that. And uh, then they may ask the mental health professional. So uh, we should, uh, in those instances, uh, we should uh, tell the uh, person's spouse that uh, we need to do a formal clinical evaluation of this uh, particular person where this NSSI is there. And uh, then we have to uh, understand all these factors uh, uh, which would have led to that past NSSI uh, in that uh, person. And uh, uh, currently, uh, whatever the psychological support that person requires has to provide it. If they continue to have that behavior right now, we need to evaluate and provide. Otherwise, if there are any significant psychological issues, we need to provide the support. And with regards to future prognosis, uh, we need to uh, tell the uh, spouse that uh, they need not be very apprehensive. And uh, if emergence of any uh, specific emotional or behavioral symptoms at any point of time, or if there is a uh, recurrence of the NSSI uh, or any other uh, uh, signs or symptoms at any point of time, they can definitely come for a consultation. But we should not... Uh, you know, uh, create a lot of uh, fear in that uh, particular spouse. And uh, here there may be, uh, again, like uh, we need to be very careful about uh, uh, diagnosing uh, conditions like personality disorder or uh, no, uh, whatever the psychiatric diagnosis, uh, unless there is uh, uh, a formal evaluation and which uh, no, gives uh, an adequate history or uh, no, when we do the mental states examination, we are able to formally diagnosed, then only we should make. Otherwise, there could be certain legal issues also here. Uh, you know, we uh, may, uh, without proper evaluation, if we just uh, tell the person saying that uh, the uh, spouse is having a personality issue or something like that, so that may result in trouble uh, for the couple. Yeah, that's a very important and a practical question as to how to deal with this. And these are common questions that come and it's a googly really. And Dr. John has told you how to save yourself from there and be very meticulous in your documentation and exactly yes. what you write. That is very important. The documentation part, uh, Madam has highlighted, that is very important. And uh, we have to, uh, I think, uh, you know, whether we are in the government setting or private setting, we have to maintain certain documents, especially some of these uh, patients uh, where, uh, you know, uh, like NSSI or any other uh, self-injurious behavior is a sensitive area and uh, we need to be very careful and uh, uh, have the documentation, especially when we are making referrals also, writing clear referral letters and when we are working with the school, uh, you know, any license activities, taking uh, prior consent of the parents and documenting that. Uh, and also when we are writing letters to different people, uh, also, uh, you know, the kind of words we use in those letters, we need to be very careful and uh, we should not uh, just uh, use these diagnostic terms very loosely, saying that this person has personality disorder or something else or something else, because the other person may not understand this, so, you know, like a mental health professional. So one needs to be careful. That's very true. That uh, one has to be really, uh, really um, careful about what we are saying and what we are writing. Another factor that we always say is that one of the common things between, say, personality disorders and uh, an NSSI is the emotional dysregulation. And uh, the emotional dysregulation and all the other factors which could be leading to borderline personality traits could be also the mediating influence for 
this kind of self injurious behavior and then one has to address those things also and i think if you are in a as sir was asking if you were in a in a, a children's home there are many other issues which the child and the adolescent is facing or has faced including maybe adverse childhood experiences and many other things that have happened which could also lead to many uh, uh, predisposing risk factors which could all work synergistically to cause traits of a borderline personality disorder and also probably um, self injurious uh, behavior which is non suicidal but more research really is required to kind of differentiate and tease out what is there but as we stand today um, uh, we really look at it as a uh, not as a mental illness but maybe a part of some illnesses but look at it as how to approach it how to treat it therapeutically how to work with it in the uh, in the clinic and in your hospitals and niti has again put up a question is uh, can there be a uh, uh, oh okay can you elaborate can, can the how an nssi can be there without a mental illness yes uh, so in a uh, few adolescents actually there could be the non suicidal self injury uh they may have significant emotional distress uh they may have certain behavioral changes also uh but uh, these emotional and behavioral changes what they are having may not reach the diagnostic threshold uh for uh, a mental health professional to consider a uh, diagnosis of any of the uh, access one or access to uh, psychiatric disorders uh so whether it be a depression or anxiety disorders or personality disorders uh eating disorders etc so they may have certain difficulties but it may all be sub syndrome so that is uh, one possibility uh, that we can come across in some of the adolescents thank you so i think we managed to answer most of the questions and very comprehensively to give you in this last one hour, we have really um gone through the whole gamut of what is non um, non suicidal self injurious behavior what causes it how do you approach it what are the do's and don'ts um uh, how do you treat it and also all the gamut of questions that came up that was a very interesting and a fruitful talk i uh, thank you uh, very much dr john for a very excellent uh, interaction and again i thank rashmin for having both of us here over to you rashmin thank you very much and uh, thank you once again uh, dr john and uh, uh, dr kinal for having taken the time out and uh, being with us this evening it was as you know rightly pointed a very comprehensive talk and uh, i think the q and a was the cherry on the cake because uh, it uh, addressed some of the very pertinent and uh, clinically relevant questions and uh, this has uh, always been a challenging area for many of us who see a lot of adolescents in our practice and uh, it's very confounding uh, in terms of how do you deal with these so this was definitely a great session and uh, i hope uh, it has given us a lot of uh, food for thought and we'll probably be able to incorporate these concepts into our day to day clinical practices uh, so thank you once again dr john thank you hinal for taking the time out and of course uh, thank you all to the lovely audience uh, we had a lot of uh, senior consultants with us today as well so clearly we're doing something right and uh, hopefully we will endeavor to bring you such interesting and clinically relevant as well as academically uh, challenging uh, topics uh, in the future as well and uh, a, a great thank you to uh, all the postgraduate students who have so enthusiastically continued to be a part of this uh, knowledge series and of course i'd be remiss in not thanking sun pharma for their unstinting and uh, unconditional educational grant for this uh, program so thank you once again all of you and i bid you a good evening ahead have a great day thank, thank you sir you. Uh, thank you ma'am and i thank all the consultants and uh, the postgraduate trainees for their active participation uh, have a good evening thank you thank you very much